I'd like to thank you all for coming to the seminar. It's a very special privilege for me to uh, meet with colleagues and share some of the experiences I've had over the years. Um, so we'll get started. Why the seminar? First, I have to tell you, I found teaching to be highly rewarding. And over the years, I think I developed an approach that seems to appeal to students in a major way. To learn as a result of that a great deal more than the traditional way of teaching. And, and you create a bond between the instructor and the students. And I'd like to demonstrate to you that that is indeed the case. So I'd like to share with you some of this in the hope that you can take bits and pieces of what we go through today and maybe incorporate it in your own teaching. That's the purpose. Now, there are two pieces to teaching. There's the mechanics and there's the culture. Now, we tend to focus on the mechanics, the lectures, the homeworks, the exams, the labs, etc. We tend to ignore the culture. The culture means the connection between the instructor and the students. Superior teaching, in my definition, is when both the components, the mechanics, and the culture are paid uh, a great deal of attention. And I'd like to demonstrate that to you. So what are we going to do today? I'm going to start by bragging. And the reason for bragging is not just the sake of bragging, but to uh, get to convince you that maybe there's something worthwhile there, worthy of spending 40 minutes, 50 minutes today to, to hear uh, the, the presentation. Next, I will talk a little bit about what I usually do exactly one week before the first day of class. And the intent there is to get the students' attention. Then what do we do on the first day of class? Because those define the nature and the character of the course for the rest of the semester. Talk about one-on-one -on -one meetings that I have with students, lecture style, tech briefs, technology briefs, and then I'll take your questions. So let me start by bragging. Uh, in ECE, the Student Society is called the Ada Kappa Nu, and every year they... And when you get elected, you're not eligible again for another five years. And the numbers there show you what has happened. So the question is why? Why are the students um, selecting this individual as their professor of the year? On a university-wide basis, they don't do this very often, but in 2016, all university students were invited to uh, select what they call professors that keep you on your toes. And out of those, they selected the top 10. And out of the top 10, only one came out of engineering, the College of Engineering. Again, the question is why? What's so special that made those students feel so dedicated? So now that I have your attention saying, maybe there's something worthwhile listening to, we're gonna go through the material in more detail. So I will focus on a course because it's much easier to put things in the context of a course. And the course is 215, circuits course that Fred sometimes teaches and I teach sometimes. Uh, and this is the last time I taught it, which was as an undergraduate course uh, in 2018. I had two sections. And if you look over here, uh, I had 70 students in the section. And of the 70, 65 did the course evaluation. Now the average for the university of course evaluation on parts of students is 26%. So most courses, very few students take the time to do the evaluation. Why is it here that they've connected to the course to the point taking the time to do the evaluation? This is section one. Section two, let me go back here. No, back up, back up. Uh, section two had, like I said, uh, 67 students and 62 of those did the evaluation. 
So between the two sections I was teaching that semester, I had 137 students, quite a number of students. Now, if you look at the ratings for the, by the students, it says the instructor treated students with respect, 4.94 out of five. Overall, this was an excellent course, 4.85. Uh, overall, the instructor was an excellent teacher, 4.97. I learned uh, a great deal from this course, 4.85. So these are the, the numerics. But what about the qualitative? So if we look at the qualitative, um, you, you get the following kind of uh, the, uh, statements by the students. And this is from the, from the evaluation form that is written by the students. Professor Ulubi is possibly the best professor I've had at this university. The instruction was clear, although somewhat fast paced. Pressure. Instruction is phenomenal and so on. And this goes on and on one after the other. Excellent professor is the best professor I've had at the University of Michigan. Why are these students so impressed by the style of teaching? So let's go on. Now, a little more. Detail. So this one says, Professor Hope is absolutely the best teacher I've ever had. Not only is he talented as a scientist and instructor, he's genuinely interested in the success of his students. From the first day, he makes his expectations for students very clear. And if you work at the standards he sets, you will be very successful and learn an incredible amount. So the point here of this approach. I believe the students end up learning 50% more than the traditional method. So making it harder on the student, the expectations out of the students are very high and yet they come through. Student number six says, he's a great teacher, this, that, and so on. But then he says, oh, I also really like the technology briefs. And we're gonna be talking about that in more detail in, the, in, a, uh, in a second. Another student says, I like the lecture slides in tandem with the notes from the class. Again, this is another part of the formula and I will be illustrating what that means shortly. Another one says, uh, he recognizes that we are enrolled in school to learn, not to earn a grade. To learn, not to earn a grade. This is a very different approach. The standard approach is compete against the others. This one, they don't compete against other students. They compete against their own potential. And that's a different way of thinking. The grading is then done differently, the lecturing, all of it. And we'll look at that in more detail. So the course components. As I mentioned, there is the 215 intro lecture on day one teaching style, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and so on. And we'll go through those things in a little more detail. So the first contact with students. One week before the first class, I send via Canvas a message to all the students enrolled in that class. First, I welcome them to the course and promise them a rewarding learning experience. Two, they are instructed to download from Canvas the PowerPoint slides for chapter one. And I'll go into that in a little more detail to print a hard copy, place it in a three ring binder, just like these three ring binders and to bring it to class on day one. And sure enough on day one, one of the questions I asked them is, show me your three ring binders. And about 80, 90% will have them. And the other 10% to say, you better show me those at the next class or you're not gonna stay in this course. So by the second class, 100% of them, they bring their three bring binders to every single class. Why? Because it's part of the teaching style, which I will get into. And I also tell them, read certain set of pages in the textbook and be prepared to take a quiz to answer questions about that content. Now, all of this happens one week before day one. And I'm telling them, this is what's gonna happen on day one. Day one, we do three things. We do the intro about the course, and I'll go through those slides shortly. 
we give them a quiz. So now you have that attention. They want class the first day and they have a quiz because you've promised them so and you've asked them to study for it. And then the binder test, the one I was mentioning, show me your binders. The first thing I do in that first day of class is I try to put things in context. Not only the topic of the course, but the individuals. And so I start out with this chart for this particular course. So let's look at the world's population. 50 years ago, we had about 4 billion people on this planet. Today, we have 8 billion. Question is, how did we manage to support the additional 4 billion people? Support them in food, support them in shelter, support them in healthcare, transportation, communication, everything else. And the standard of living is better today than it was 4 billion years, for uh, 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 50 years ago. How did we do it? Who did it? I claim it is the scientists and engineers who are college graduates who did it. So out of all the population worldwide, the number of college graduates is 2%. Only two out of 100 people have gone to college and gotten a college degree. Now, out of those college graduates, if we look at the distribution here, we have for the US, for example, about 347,000 who graduated with a degree in business. And you go down the different disciplines, we get to engineering, engineering, engineering technology is on 84,000, that translates into 5%. So 5% of college graduates are engineers and they represent 2% of the population. So that means that there's a tiny little segment of society that are the technologists. And it is those technologies that over the past 50 years developed what it took a farmer who used to uh, plant a hundred acres 50 years ago, now can do, do a thousand acres, 10 times as much food as, as he was able to do uh, 50 years ago. And similarly, all the other pieces that support society. You, you are lucky to be in this class and to be college students and to be engineers. Society supported you to get to this point and now you owe it to society to succeed and to support society into the future and the next decade and the decades to come. So now they, I am telling them what I expect their role is gonna be vis-a-vis -vis society as a whole. That puts it in context. In addition, you get a good salary out of it. You get a good income. So look at the salaries here. This is 2015 numbers. Petroleum engineers are at the very top. And you go down, but doing pretty well. So you're gonna be uh, uh, paid well for it. And you're gonna serve society in a very positive way. Course objectives. Now I'm talking to them like I'm talking to you, like I'm talking to them. To equip the EE and CE major with a fundamental understanding to introduce the student to the engineering applications of electronics, to help the students develop the learning skills and self-discipline. Those two are very key elements of success. And to enjoy the learning experience. All of those need to be part of the course. By the end of the course, what are your expectations? Your expectation is to have a pretty good idea of how an LCD works, how a cell phone antenna works, how the cell phone architecture works. And we're gonna do tech briefs. Tech briefs means shorted, uh, short explanations of how a certain technology works that connects to the basics that are in the course. So you can go from what you see around you like a cell phone, everybody knows structure and what the cell phone, but the students at this level, they're sophomores. They don't know anything about the architecture and, the, and so on. So you, you, you spend 10 to 15 minutes in class going through that. And boy, they enjoy that. They love it because now they're connecting those fundamental little equations that they work with and diagrams 
to something real. LED, how does a, 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 a light emitting diode work? What are the fundamentals for it? You will learn that in class and display technology. So these are the things, and I'm sharing with you that particular course. Of course, it applies to uh, different things, apply to different courses. Now, what do you expect from me as students? You expect commitment to help you succeed. You expect good course organization from me and great labs and course GSIs because the course has labs to go with it. What do I expect from you? I expect you to spend the right amount of time to get the grade in that course. So if you're looking for an A grade in the course, that's gonna require 18 hours per week on average. I expect good, yes, sir. Does that include time spent in class or just Additional time outside of class. Total. Total. Because they're learning some of it in class, they're learning some of it in the lab, they're learning some of it outside. On average, for a, 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 per week, 18 hours. And this, and it's, of course, this varies from student to student, but as an average. I expect good organizational skills on your part, always submitting things on time, acting with honesty and integrity and be mindful of those people you're working with, instructors and fellow students. Then I tell them who is who, who is the instructor, who are the GSIs, this, what the book, textbook is and so on. And the course of course has four lectures. We will have do demonstrations, problem solving sessions, unannounced quizzes. We have quizzes throughout the semester. I wanna keep them on their toes all the time. I want them to come to class prepared. And of course, there is a lab segment too that goes with it. Another rule, no food. Yes. How often do you do quizzes in practice? How many? How often? I mean, is it like once a week? Once oh, week, like on very good. So the class meets um, uh, three times a week. Right, And every week you can expect at least one quiz. Most of the time it's one, some weeks it's two. So they're never sure what's gonna happen. So you, you change it back and forth and so on. You wanna keep them on their toes. Yeah. Is the quiz on material you presented in the lecture or is it on material they read but you haven't yet started talking? Usually it's on material you covered in the very last lecture. So you want to make sure that they took that material, they integrated it, they, they digested it and so on, and they're in a position to act on it. Yes? Is the quiz part of the grade? Is it graded or is it- The quizzes? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I will show you that in a second. Um, so no food, no drink, yes? Late homework? Late homework? Yeah. Uh, no late homework. Not Zero. Now, if a student comes in and says, I was sick and I have something, then you give them special time and you give them extra time or you discount that homework from the grade or something. But aside from that, they lose the grade altogether. Um, no cell phones, no electronics, no laptops in class. Class will always start on time. Don't come in late. Now, sometimes a student may need to leave early because he or she has a medical appointment or this or that or an interview. That's okay, but tell me at the beginning of class so I'm aware of what's going to happen. Homeworks are due them on a certain schedule in a certain place. You drop it here, you drop it there, and so on and so forth. Mechanics. Uh, working together. You are encouraged to work with classmates on homework problems. The idea is to learn. And if two students, three students together sit down and try and work out this homework problem, that's fine. They want to learn from it. Now, I require that you write on that problem. I cooperated with John Smith on this problem. So there's a record, there's an integrity piece. But that's all right, work together. 
grading, not on a curve, because you're competing against yourself, not against other students. When you need help, if it is lab related, go to the lab instructor, don't come to me. If it is mechanics, like how do I integrate this function? How do I differentiate that? How do I solve this problem? Go to the JSI, not me. So in a 215, I was giving the example, we had four or five JSIs. I made sure that each GSI has to give in five to six hours of office hours. And we spread out those hours. So between four to five of them, I have about 25 hours spread out between 9.30 in the morning and about three o'clock in the afternoon. So over that middle section of the day, when students have classes, there are always, almost every hour of the, the week, there is a GSI available to help them. And they can go and get help. Me assigning five or six office hours is going to make it very difficult for them to, to seek my help. And I don't want to talk to them about it. That's not what an instructor is for. I want to talk to them about their career and about concepts. If a student says, I don't understand this particular theory or this particular, con oh, I'd love to sit down and chat with them about it, but not about how do I solve this little homework problem? Because the GSIs are much better at it. Now that frees me since I don't have office hours anymore. All semester long. That frees me to do the one-on-one, -on -one, which I will get into in, in uh, uh, shortly. Okay. Then they have to sign up. Yes. So you mentioned a, a bunch of errors for um, office hours for the GSIs every day. Um, and you had about 130 students in your class. How many GSIs did you have? I had five GSIs, I think. And so if each of them is giving about five hours, that's 25 hours. And you work with the GSI such that they don't overlap. So you have a, almost a uniform section of the day, every day, where the students know that room so and so, where the GSIs are, are located, they go there and they find someone. So you have an army of GSIs for the week. Yeah, because it was a large class and has labs and so on, so it worked. Right. right. Can I ask one more question? Obviously, it varies from size of the class and level. But the question was about the point you're about to make about getting to help students with the 15 uh, individual meetings. Right. I'm going to go through that. So um, on day one, the students are told there's a website, go to it and sign up for a 15 minute meeting one on one. I usually arrange those meetings, even though I had 137 students, I met with every single one of them. I usually arrange them all day Friday, all day Saturday two weeks in a row, the first two weeks of class. So by the end of the second week of class, I've met with every single student. What happens in those 15 minutes? I will go through that shortly. Is it mandatory for students? It is mandatory. Now, you tell them to do it, and as you might expect, 80% of them do it, 20% do not. That's when I turn the list over to my assistant in the office, and she starts writing to them, hey, 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 hey. And by the third day, everybody signed up. So sometimes you have to push and you have to, but that's what it takes. Um, I give them the dates for the exams and the distribution. Someone asked about um, quizzes. Quizzes amount to 100 points out of however many total number of points uh, all of these things add up to. So you can see that quizzes add up to two thirds of an exam. Exam is 150 points. Okay. Um, then I tell them, you need to be respectful of people you deal with. We have a person called Rob Giles. Rob uh, is a technician in the department and he will help with issues related to MATLAB. Tell them, let's take a look at these three messages. You are John and you, in the first message you say, I'm having trouble with MATLAB, what should I do? John, second message says, hi, I'm having trouble with MATLAB to generate plots. So now a little more detail, please advise sincerely, John. The third one says, dear Mr. Giles, I'm having trouble getting MATLAB to generate plots. When might I be con convenient mind to meet with you? Best wishes, John. 
So put yourself in, in Mr. Giles' shoes and he gets these three messages. Which one of these would you think he's gonna to respond to? He's gonna to respond to the third one immediately. He's gonna to respond to the third one, to the first one, two days later. All it takes you is a little bit of sensitivity and respect and so on, and, and the rewards are huge. It registers. Because in this day and age, everybody goes tick, 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 five words and they send it out. That's not my style. So presentation style. Now we can do it using all PowerPoint, slide after slide. And the students are sitting there passively and it's going choo, choo, choo. Or you can do it on the board and it takes time to draw diagrams and so images and so on. Or you can use a mixed model, which is what I use. So when I tell them, create the three ring binder, the, th the material is given to them. And this is one, one example of one page in the three ring binder, right? These are the slides I'm gonna go through, but this is what they have in the three ring binder. In class now on the tablet, I start writing. And as I write, they write. So they're engaged with every single slide because they're doing all the math, the equations and so on, as opposed to sitting passively. By the end of the hour, they have integrated both the material that I had given them with the actual writing and comments and so on. And the idea is that afterwards, they add to it what they had read in the book. And that, that becomes an integrated set of materials. So before class, Print a copy of PowerPoint slides, I tell them for the chapter, place it in a three ring binder, review the material from the last class, and this is where it comes in about the quizzes, and look through the next 15 slides. Get acquainted with them. Make sure you have read the book sections as signed in the syllabus. That's before class. In class, take notes and write observations on the hard copy of PowerPoint slides. Do not sit back passively. And after class, add notes to your PowerPoint binder. From memory and the book, to be effective, this should happen within 24 hours. You don't wanna wait till the next class. You wanna do it shortly after class, ideally that evening. Class was this morning, that evening you take a little time you reflect on those slides, you look at the book, this, that, and integrate the pieces. That material, that three ring binder becomes your Bible because you're gonna use it to study for exams because it's integrated all the pieces together now. I give them, of course, the schedule for uh, the syllabus, what we're gonna cover, what topics, what exams, what homeworks, what this, all of this is done at the uh, beginning. There's another item that's called the Thursday Forum. This is where I say, send questions about anything related to the discipline we're in, ECE, including technical topics, concepts you're not clear about, careers, professions, grad school, anything. I then, and I ask them to frame their questions very clearly. I then select from some of those. I then prepare four or five slides, however many it takes to address that. And of course, I'd like to choose topics that may be of interest to a broad range of students as opposed to just one singular. If it's one singular, I'll tell that student, why don't you come over to my office? We'll talk about it there. Yes. So is Thursday, is this part of a regular class? Is this a discussion? It's part of the, it's, it, oh yeah, I, I don't have discussion per se. Okay. So it's part of the regular class, but I do it only on Thursdays. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Do you need the entire class section on Thursday for that? Yeah, so so the class meets four times a week, and one of them is Thursday. So I, I just do those presentations on Thursday, but there's nothing special about Thursday being different from any other day. You said four times a week. Is it meeting? Is it uh, four, it's a four credit class? It's a four credit class. So one of the hours must be had or discussion, and then the rest is. Yeah, I don't believe in the, in the distinction of discussion and so on. To me, a course just keeps going. So, but we do meet for times a week plus a lab plus lab but it is a four credit course or is it five i forgot it's four yeah 
Um, no, no, it's usually 10 minutes. Yeah, usually 10 minutes of the Thursday class is to address a topic. Yeah. So also on day one, so after I've explained, gone through all of this material that I just went through here is the material that I share with them on day one. I then give them a quiz. And this happens to be the quiz I gave that last time I, I taught it. What is the wavelength frequency relationship? What are the three forces in there? The point of the quiz is just to get their attention, right? To say, hey, have you read the material, pages one through 15? Because there was one section in there about this. So, uh, I forgot one one or the other. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean the quiz usually is a five minute thing, right? Here is here, and it's straightforward. It's, if they've studied it, they got it. Yeah. Is it graded? It is graded. Yeah. They get the grade next. I will talk about that shortly. Okay. So there's a clear message. Yes. No, so I take, uh, well, sometimes I pass out the piece of paper with exactly what is over here and they fill it in and then I collect it. So the day one clear message on expectations, on the rules, on preparedness. Quiz one gets their attention. And then I ask them about the three ring binder. That takes care of the first day of class and you set the tone for the rest of the semester. Teaching approach. You wanna introduce a new concept. You wanna illustrate solution through an example. I'm sure everybody does that, but I'll go through it here. Use a typical homework problem in class so they can get a sense of what the expectations of the homework problems are. Uh, oftentimes we sort of leave the homework problems alone and they have to deal with them separately. No, select one of the end of chapter problems and actually go through it. Use a typical, okay, give students 10 minutes to solve that homework problem, then go through the solution together. Say, John, what do you think, we sh how should we approach this problem? Meetings, this is the one-on-one -on -one meetings that we talked about earlier. So there is the website sign up. Typically it's either 10 minutes or 15 minutes long. And you start out by getting to know them. So the questions I start out with, and then of course the conversation moves depending on the individual says, where did you grow up? Says in Ohio or someplace that I, okay. Where did you, why did you decide to uh, use EE or CE as a major? Where did you, uh, where do you see yourself in five years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, do you wanna practice this? Are you trying to get an MBA after that? Or what, what, what are your interests as an, as, as a, as a, an individual? And then what questions do you have? So again, conversation varies depending on the individual. Now, before that meeting with the student, I have a sheet of paper with a picture of the student and the name. So after I meet with the student, I scribble a few notes in there about that individual so I can get to know them a little bit and I can remember it later. Next question is, how do you do it with 137 students? I mentioned earlier, I don't have office hours. And if I want to meet with 137 students for 10 to 15 minutes each, that's 25 hours. If I have five or six hours of office hours, five to six hours of office hours every, every week for a semester for 13 weeks, that's 100 hours. Instead, I'm just using out of that 100 hours since I don't have office hours and they go and go to GSIs for their questions. I'm using 25 hours to meet with them the first two weeks. And then the students can come in anytime they want to for, to discuss this topic or that topic. 
and it adds up to maybe another 25 hours. I'm still at the 50% compared to the traditional method of saying I have five to six hours I'm dedicating every week. So you're not spending more time and yet your time is much more effective. Uh, this is an example of the pictures that I have and this is all downloadable and I can create it and so on, but I use it for a different purpose. Yes. Uh, earlier on this slide or earlier for this, yeah, yeah, but 10 minutes, uh, right? So let's assume you're introducing a new topic, right? And you start talking about it, lecturing it, and they're writing and so on. And uh, towards the last quarter of the hour, you say, Okay, let's see how well we understand it. Here's a problem, solve it, and you have 10 minutes to solve it. And so they start working on it, and then you say, Okay. Now, let's go through it. They don't turn anything in, but they have given it 10 minutes of trying to uh, 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 digest it and figure it out and so on. And then you start going through it and you're asking for suggestions and ideas as to how to approach it, and then you solve it. Right, 15 minutes. That's okay, that's part of learning. I think we worry too much about the amount of material in my book, I'd rather teach them 90% of what I could, but do it with depth and with, with good understanding. Uh, her. In those 10 minutes, are they working on the problem individually? Individually, yeah. So I write the, the problem on the board, right? Or on the screen. And I say, go at it. And everybody's working on their own problem and so on. Then I say, okay, now we've had long enough. Let's do it together. They do it together and say, how many of you came up with that uh, same answer? They raise their hand. Oh, two thirds, okay. The other one third who didn't get it, now they have an understanding as to what they missed or what now. Because your students can work in groups, right? In they can work in group. Two people here can uh, collaborate and so on. It's all right, it's learning. So for every class, one second, for every class, I choose four or five students. I have their pictures, so I can memorize. I say Naomi, beautiful face. I look at her, or uh, at this guy, Thomas Cope, for example. I have four or five. I know the names, I know the faces. And so in class, as I'm lecturing about something, I get to a point and I turn over there and I say, Thomas, because now I know the face, right? Thomas, what do you think we should do here to go to the next step or to do da 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 da? By choosing four or five students in a given class, and then another four or five the next class, and another four or five the next class, they now know that I know them. I know who they are, and I know their names and their faces, and there is that connection that gets established. And that seems to mean a whole lot to them. Your question. Have you been reading this photo? These are the different photos that are everybody has, right? Yes. They look nothing, nothing like most of them. Like most of them, look really <laughs> 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 and, like some of them just look really nothing like it. Well, you know, no, like, uh, 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 I, 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 granted, uh, but you know, you, you, you just do the your best. But remember, you've met with them in person too. Right, the 15 minutes in person, now you look at her, okay, her hair is long, her hair now is short, or, you know, but you start connecting to them and recognizing them. Oh, well, this is before COVID, so uh, <laughs> when I did it, so if, of course, it makes things more difficult. So final exam, uh, first exam. So I share a sample exam and solution a week ahead. Just so they can get a sense of how many problems, the level of complexity and so on. Then in class, we do an, an in-class trial exam. And then a solution of the in-class exam the very next day. 
So they do the full hour. Next day we come in, we go through it. Then we do the real exam and I'll get into that. We meet with each student who scores below a C. Any student who scores below a C, I say, come see me. I wanna find out why. Then I give a second chance exam if needed. The whole class say, okay. The average for the class was 82, not good enough. So I'm gonna do a second exam, same material, slightly more difficult. And the student gets the better of the two grades of the exam and the new exam. If you got a hundred the first time and you don't wanna take the second time, you don't have to. If you got a 90 and you don't wanna do it again, you don't have to, but you have that option. Yes. This is only for the first exam? No, for all exams. So the exams, they're designed such that most students can do them in an hour to an hour and a half, but they, are, they get three hours because they're all evening exams. So there is no time pressure. The idea here is not to test their, how fast they can do it. We're testing how well they understand the material and different students operate at different uh, paces. Final exams three hours also. I never ask permission for. I never ask permission from anybody. Uh, so you want to eliminate the time pressure. Uh, so they're competing again against their own potential. No curve. The second chance exam is uh, if warranted. Grading, uh, the homework, it's important that if they turn the, the homework today and there's a class tomorrow, they get the homework uh, graded and returned by the very next day. And the graders know that. Graders pick them up at five o'clock in the evening and by nine o'clock the next morning, they're dropped off at my office. So this way there is quick feedback. Same thing with exams, take an exam today, that very next day it's passed out and I go through the solution. It's all because this way they, 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 they're still fresh in their minds. Are they multiple choice? No, no, no such thing. No, no, no. So if the exam ends at let's say eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the evening, because these are evening exams, then at eight o'clock the next morning, I'm there with three or four of the GSIs. I train them on the solutions for the different say, We sit there for two to three hours, it's done. I bring them to class and pass them out. Um, proctoring. The system we have in the college is that while students are taking the exam, you sit outside. I say, malarkey. I sit and I proctor and I look at them and I make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. But I also offer them the option if they're really stuck on a problem to walk around and come see me and say, I'm stuck on this problem number two. I don't know how. To. And so I start asking questions, I ask a question. I never tell them anything, but I ask question and another. And it's a, by the third question, it clicks and the student runs back, sits at the desk and starts working through the solution. Again, I'm helping them learn as opposed to say, oh, I'm helping the student with information and therefore that's not fair against the others. It's not against the others. What the student, at the end of the semester, I wanna give a grade that reflects that student's understanding of the subject matter. Ninety percent is an A, right? Yeah. So let me integrate all of these pieces together. He's student number eighteen. He says it's not his impressive resume or the fact that he's written the books, da, 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 courses, but his dedication to the students that makes him stand out. Things like taking time to speak one-on-one -on -one with each student, 
He took time to offer an optional redo of the first exam, despite the fact that the average was rather high. It was apparent that the intent was to provide an incentive to those who had perhaps fallen behind to catch up with the class. And for many, that's exactly what it did. He monitors the class, knows who's attending, who isn't, who studies and who doesn't. It's this dedication to his students that makes him stand out. Student goes on. Says, I also found it unique that he grades the exams himself. After an exam, I have friends express concern that their performance may not just affect their grade, but that they may have disappointed Professor Ulubi. That's because of the person connection that become like my children or grandchildren or whatever the right connection is. And they feel I have connected with them. They don't wanna disappoint me. So this is aside from the grade. And that's a wonderful feeling. This is a phenomenon I have never encountered before, but yet one that I completely understand as I have harbored the concern myself. Personally, I had a difficult time this semester, mostly resulting from a series of minor uh, personal disasters that com combined to rob me of the time I needed to devote to school. He doesn't know it, but his policies and the way he ran class were perhaps the only thing that kept me on track this semester, and I am immensely grateful. Those are the rewards that an instructor can get. And this captures sort of the essence of it. Tech teacher, hearts human. This was an article that was published in the Michigan Daily by students, I knew, I have no idea who they are or, or whatnot and so on. But the, again, the point is, it's, it's, it can, we can teach the technical material, but we need to connect them, connect with them as people. Um, I'm gonna skip this. So how do we make the learning of fundamentals and undergraduate courses more relevant, interesting? Uh, how can we take advantage of technology to integrate theory and hardware? And I'll just give a few examples. Technology briefs are intended to bridge the gap. We do interactive simulation modules that they can do on computers and this and that and so on to synthesize and to simulate. And then we do hardware. Examples, technology briefs. This is in a particular topic. Micro nanotechnology, superconductivity, light emitting diodes, uh, integrated circuit fabrication, touch screens, and, and so on and so forth. These are things they see around them. And each of them is about one to two pages. It's got a diagram, it's got the basics, it's got this and connects it to the basic material that they have covered in the class. When we talk about LEDs, this is a good example. So you can talk about the mechanics of it and how you create white light and all of that, but then, you want to bring it to into something related to economics. So he says, okay, we have incandescent bulbs, we have fluorescent bulbs, and now we have LEDs. Why are LEDs so special? Let's take a look at energy consumption. At the power plant, to generate electricity, it's 35% efficient. Transmission line, fortunately, are 92% efficient over a distance of 100 miles. But the light bulb, the regular light bulb, is only 2.4% efficient. The net result is the net energy that we get out of it is less than 1%. So the light bulb is the, is the Achilles heel of generating electricity into light. Let's compare. So if we look at the luminous efficacy, which is how much light it generates, and you compare a bulb, it generates 12 lumens, compared to an LED generates 150, that's an order of magnitude better. And if you look at the useful lifetime, go from 1,000 hours to 100,000 hours. And if you look at the total cost, for a regular light bulb is $410, 
for an LED, it's $40, economics. Now they look at that and say, okay, now we understand the, how an LED works, but we can appreciate why it is important economically. I'm not gonna get into other examples because uh, we don't have enough time to do it. So I'm gonna skip all of this. Above all, you need to connect to the student of the class, emphasize learning over grades and help them become disciplined professionals. This is a, uh, my last slide that I'm gonna show here. So in one of my, in, in that class uh, I was teaching, one student says, what can I do to get extra uh, credit? And I thought about it. I play racquetball. I've been playing racquetball for years. I said, you have to beat me at racquetball. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it was a joke, but uh, several of them came to me later on. Can we really play racquetball? I said, okay. So we arranged a uh, racquetball tournament, if you like, and NCRB here, we reserved all the courts. And we did it one week after I submitted the grades for that class. So it had nothing to do with the course, with who participated, who didn't participate. And they came, we, these two, uh, four played in this court, four played on that court and so on. We mixed them around. I ended up playing with all of them when we took a picture together. Um, true rewards. I got so many wedding invitations from former students. Um, one student had a dual degree in ECE and in the School of Music, and at the end of the semester in music, they have to do a recital. He did a violin recital, and he invited me to that violin recital. Th things that are sweet, and there have been many other stories. I'm not going to go through all of them. So I thank you. I'm happy to answer any last uh, questions. Uh, I have my email in the material that you got. So if you have questions later on, you can ask me. And if you want to send any, in, any comments or reactions to this seminar to our associate dean, please do so. Yes, sir. Uh, 